Good evening, and welcome to the fifth event in our 2023 public speaker series, Looking Back, Moving Forward. I am Dr. Jordan Pitt. I am a proud Bureau of Government man, and I am one of the conveners for this series, along with Professor Thomas Karma and Vanessa Sewell. I join you this evening from Ghana land. I would like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of this land, as well as the lands in which you are all tonight. Of course, a special mention to the Ngunnawal country where the Australian Academy of Science and Shine Dome are located. As we share our own knowledge, teaching, learning, and research practices, may we also pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. Now I would like to hand over to our MC for this evening, Academy Fellow and Associate Director at the Research School of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the ANU, Professor Naomi McClure-Griffiths. Thank you for being there at the... Sh Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for being there at the Shine Dome tonight. Naomi, over to you. and fresh-faced, ready to learn a bit more about Australian culture, because as far as I knew, Australia was Crocodile Dundee. Now, when I was here in August of 20, uh, 2003, time flies, Mars was at its closest approach to the Earth in some 60,000 years, and it was a great opportunity to go to the local observatory and have a look at this beautiful planet and see it a tiny bit bigger and a tiny bit brighter than normal. It was the first time that I asked somebody about Aboriginal knowledge of the stars. And the response that I got was extraordinarily dismissive and quite racist. Aboriginal people don't practice astronomy, I was told. Aboriginal people don't have any science. They're just myths and legends and some names. Quite peculiar, I thought. Tens of thousands of years, not only surviving but thriving on this continent, and there's no structured knowledge about the environment around you, including the stars? Well, okay, that was quite strange. I went back to the US, but I had the most amazing time in Australia, and it became a bit of an obsession to move back. 
When I moved back, I was pursuing a degree in astrophysics, but I got drawn back to this question about this problem that I had faced. What do you mean there's no science here? What do you mean Aboriginal people don't practice science? It did not take more than a cursory glance at even some of the most basic stories and traditions to see a rich depth and complexity of science that is woven and embedded through them. I made a decision at that point to turn my attention away from the world of astrophysics and into the world of Aboriginal astronomy. Maybe a strange thing for a white American to do, but it was something that I found quite fascinating. And I thought, well, if nobody else is going to look at the science of this, bloody hell, I'll do it. And that led me on a journey that I never expected would bring me here or to the pathway that I've taken. But what I want to talk to you about is this idea of science that's embedded within indigenous knowledges. And when I talk about science, I'm talking about understanding the world around us. How did it form? How does it work? How are things interconnected? What does it tell us? And of course, how do we do science? We do it through observation. We do it through deduction, through experimentation. It has some kind of practical application. It has a predictive purpose. All of that are the very foundations of science. And all of that can absolutely be found within traditional knowledge systems. Now, I've been very fortunate and honored to work with a number of communities and elders over the last 15 years. And there are a few themes that have come through in this work over that time. One of the themes that comes through very strongly is that everything on the land is reflected in the sky, and everything in the sky is a reflection of the land. As is above, so is below. On the far left there is Professor Annette Lee. She's a Lakota woman, an astrophysicist, and a professional artist. In the Lakota language, this term is called kapemni. As is above, so is below. Well, what does that mean? This means that the sky is a reflection of everything that happens on the land. It is a map. It is a clock. It is a scientific textbook. It's a law book. It's a memory space. If you want to know how things work in the world around you, you look to the stars. They will tell you. The second thing that was probably the most prominent about this talk and about my career was from Professor Martin Nakata. Professor Martin Nakata, who's currently the Deputy Vice Chancellor Indigenous at JCU in Northern Queensland, is the first Torres Strait Islander to earn a PhD in Australia. And he spoke to me when he gave me my very first job at the Nuragili Indigenous Center at UNSW in Sydney. He said, Duane, I'm bringing you here because you're a scientist. And I want you to remember, through the focus of your work, that we are not only a people of culture, we are also a people of science. And I never want you to lose your sense of scientific integrity. And he and I sat and laid down the framework for Indigenous astronomy into the future some 10, 11 years ago. So this idea that not only are we people of culture, we're people of science, is something that he speaks a lot about. Of course, he wrote quite a, a large theoretical framework that he refers to as the cultural interface. And he does a lot of work at the cultural interface of Western and indigenous science, ways of knowing. And on the far right, you'll see Uncle Alo Tapim. Uncle Alo is one of the elders from Mare in the far east of the Torres Strait. He has shared knowledge with me for years, and I have been responsible for helping to turn that knowledge into educational curricula and programs for the community. And one thing that he and every other elder that I've ever worked for says the same thing. Your ability to thrive and survive in this world depends on your ability to read your environment. In this case, your ability to read the stars. What does reading the stars mean? It sounds kind of astrological, doesn't it? Reading the stars refers to your ability to observe and interpret all of the changes, no matter how subtle, in the positions and properties of stars and objects in the sky, because they are going to tell you something. Everything has importance, everything has meaning, everything has agency. And if you know how to read that, then you are going to know how to thrive. So I want to show you here are two images. These are both by Uncle Sigar Passy. He's the senior Miriam Elder on Mare. 
And you might at first glance think they look pretty much the same, don't they? But if you look very carefully at both of them, they're going to tell you something important. They tell you about weather conditions during two different times of the year, during the dry season, the soggy air, or the cookie season, the monsoon. And it's about understanding how to read every aspect of the environment around you. You want to look at the types of clouds in the sky. You want to look at the water. You want to look at the moon. Look at the moon's reflection in the water. Every aspect of these gorgeous artworks are telling you something critically important. You see the angle of the moon changes throughout the year. That tells you about the changing seasons. And if you look at these images, when I first asked him about it, I thought, well, this image right here looks like it'd be the wet season. The ocean's really choppy, uh, big cumulonimbus clouds in the sky. It looks to me like it's going to rain. But here, it looks quite beautiful. I think this would be the dry season. He sort of laughed and shook his head, which is something I've experienced a number of times in my career. He says, you're reading it wrong. You have to think about what's going to happen in the future. What are the conditions going to be like tomorrow? Because it's not about what's happening right at this second. It's about what's going to happen. This is actually from the wet season. You see those cirrus clouds in the sky and the moon tilted off at an angle. You see a little bit of a halo around the moon. Well, you look at those cirrus clouds in that halo, and those form from ice crystals high in the atmosphere. And those ice crystals form in low fronts. And what do low fronts bring? They bring rain, right? So it's about understanding not only what you're seeing, but what that's going to tell you for the future. And that's sort of that predictive aspect I was talking about before. Now, when it comes to learning how to read the stars, we can look at when stars rise and set at dusk and dawn, and they'll tell you about changing seasons. What I wanted to focus on in the few minutes that I have left are some more of the deeper examples, things that aren't, things that aren't as obvious as the changing seasons throughout the year, depending on the position of stars in the sky. If we look at planets, for example, planets are wanderers. They're constantly moving around the sky, and each planet has its own unique dance. And elders talk about something quite interesting. All of these moving stars seem to move along a particular pathway in the sky. In Western astronomy, we call that the path of the zodiac, the main part being the uh, ecliptic where the sun goes through, goes around the sky, about nine degrees on the side of that is this pathway. And in traditional cultures, uh, Uncle Il Bill Edom Dumaharney, a senior Wadaman elder who's now in his 90s, and still kicking along just fine, talks about how in Wadaman culture, these wanderers have their own unique pathway. And they move like any of us would move down the sidewalk. Sometimes we're moving past each other. Sometimes we slow down. We might stop and chat with each other, get a planetary conjunction. Sometimes we might stop on our tracks. Maybe we drop something. Maybe we go back. Maybe we look in a shop window, and then we go forward again. But each of these planets has its own unique movement. And that idea of talking about planets moving forward, stopping, going back, and then going forward again is something we refer to in astronomy as retrograde motion. This is not unique to Australia. In uh, central Canada, for example, in Saskatchewan, uh, Uncle Wilfred Buck talks about how in Innu traditions, it's referred to in terms of a moose. Because when a moose is walking along its pathway, if it gets startled, it does a big circle and loops around to see if there's a danger. And if there's not, it continues on its original pathway. Now, I don't know how many of you look at the sky each night. Even the astronomers in the room probably never go outside and look very much. But you've really got to be paying attention to what's going on outside to notice these kinds of effects. Now, there's something that comes along these, with these planetary motions that doesn't really get recognized in modern astrophysics when it comes to the knowledges of traditional cultures. These are all morning star poles, Bannenbeer poles. And Bannenbeer is the morning star ceremony. Of course, morning star referring to the planet Venus when it's visible in the morning. It's a very special ceremony that is only held at very specific times. Now, this ceremony talks about Bannenbeer, the creation ancestor who came up from the ground and ascended into the sky and began naming the landscape as she ascended, but she was terrified of floating away, so her sisters tied a white rope to her to keep her from floating away. That white rope we can see in the sky is the diagonal light. But the timing of this ceremony is what's really critical, because it only takes place 
when Venus reappears as a morning star, to understand when this is going to happen, because these ceremonies are planned way in advance, you have to understand the synodic period of Venus. I know you didn't come here for an astrophysics lesson, but you're going to get one anyway. Right. So Venus has a very peculiar kind of movement in the sky. It will appear as a morning star for 263 days before it seems to disappear. It disappears for 50 days before it reemerges as an evening star for another 263 days. Then it disappears again, but this time it only disappears for eight days and reemerges as a morning star. This roughly 584 day cycle is called the synodic cycle. Now, understanding this means you've got to pay close attention to the positions of these objects in the sky over long periods of time. But it's also not just this 584 days. It's also a recognition that there's a particular direction. It's not just knowing the morning star is going to rise, it's knowing where it's going to rise. And why is this important? Because if you look at the position of Venus in the sky when it's visible as a morning or an evening star, something astronomers call an apparition, like a ghost, it goes, if you look at the position, it traces out five kind of peculiar patterns in the sky. Each of those repeat every eight years. So you get five apparitions over eight years. Everybody following me, right? The reason for that is because Venus and the Earth are in five-eighths resonance. For every five times Venus goes around the sun, the Earth goes around eight times. So to be able to plan these ceremonies, to know when they're going to be held, and to know where to look for Venus, you have to understand this synodic cycle. And I can tell you right now, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. Some things that have been quite exciting that are going to tie in with what we're talking about in this panel discussion with Uncle Des today is how we can look back to move forward. And one of the things that I've been looking at over the years is how understanding the science embedded within indigenous knowledge can help us challenge the history and philosophy of Western science and how these knowledge systems can help us move forward within the world of astrophysics and space sciences. And one of those areas is something that came up just a few years ago. And it ties into the last time I gave a talk here, which was in 2014. And I remember one of the astronomers in the audience asking, well, how can this knowledge benefit Western science? And at the time, I didn't have a clear answer. I was still fairly new to the game, as you might say. But now, I finally got an answer to that. So this story here is from Naringiri country down south of Adelaide along the Kurong. And it talks about the story of Wyangari a young male initiate. And through the story, a sacred taboo was broken. And facing punishment, he and two women ascended into the sky. He cast a spear into the Milky Way, pulled himself up into the sky, where he appears as a bright red star, and these two women were brought up after him. They flank him on either side. He pulled up his celestial canoe in the sky, and when these stars are high above, just after sunset, the signals to the people that the spring is coming, and what we think of as the spring is coming. Winter is leaving, and every few years, Wyangari will get hotter and brighter. And this serves as a signal to the people to follow traditional law and not break the same taboo that he broke. Now, early anthropologists, when they began writing these traditions down back in the 1800s, didn't know their astronomy very well. And they said, oh, well, this must be the planet Mars. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Because Mars is a planet. It's a wander. It's not going to be in the same part of the sky every year. What the elders were talking about was not the planet Mars, but the star Antares. Antares, the bright red star, with Tau and Sigma Scorpii being the two women on either side. So the celestial canoe, which is Scorpius, that's high above at sunset every time around springtime. And funnily enough, it's actually in the name. Antares means the anti-Ares, the rival of Ares. Who was Ares in Greek, in Greek mythology? It's the god of war. Who's the Roman god of war? Mars, right? The rivals in the sky. So ironically, it's kind of in the name that it literally means not Mars, right? <laughs> but what was interesting about this is when anthropologists, if anybody bothered to look at it, would think about, what do you mean it gets hotter and brighter every once in a while, every few years? Well, you might think, well, sometimes Mars is nearest in the solar system, it would appear brighter, which it does, and when it's further away, it appears a bit dimmer. But we're not talking about that. 
What we're talking about is the pulsation, the variability of Antares as a pulsating red giant star. Pulsating red giant variable stars were not known in Western astronomy until 1840, when Herschel made the discovery um, off the Cape of Good Hope near South Africa. But these traditions go well and truly beyond that in time. And it's not just Antares. Betelgeuse and Aldebaran are also described as changing brightness over time, which are also pulsating red giant variable stars. If early Western scholars had bothered to look at these and think of them as something beyond myth and legend, realizing that there are laws and knowledges that are encapsulated within a narrative that has to be passed down orally, they would have recognized something important. That within these narratives are telling you scientific information that you need to know. We can even look at another story from Arnhem Land that talks about the Fisherman Brothers. Two brothers went fishing in a canoe out at sea, even though they were warned by elders not to do it, because the time of the year when they were going is the time of the year where, despite beautiful weather like we have right now, heavy storms can come out of seemingly nowhere, and it's very dangerous. The two brothers ignored this advice and went fishing. A storm quickly began brewing. Recognizing it from a distance, they began paddling frantically back to shore, but the storm came too quickly. It capsized the boat, and the two brothers were put in danger. The older brother saved his younger brother's life at the expense of his own. After the storm, somebody came down to the beach and saw the wreckage of their boat, told the community, everybody ran down, they found the younger brother barely alive, and he survived, but they found the older brother who had drowned. And the traditions say that a short time later, a bright new star appeared on the sky banks of the Milky Way. And this represented, they believed, the older brother telling them that he was safe in the sky with the ancestors. The younger brother lived to be a ripe old age. and Before he was about to pass, he asked the ancestors to put him in the sky with his older brother. They became the two stars, Shala, and Lasath, and Scorpius, who we think of as the stinger stars of Scorpio. And those stars in that part of the sky, which you can see here in the middle of the Milky Way, same part of the sky we talked about before, it's these two stars right here, right in the Milky Way. At that time of the year, monsoons can seem to come out of nowhere. And it serves as a lesson, an important reminder for people to obey traditions. When the elders tell you something, you listen for a reason. Now, it could be that the story is purely allegorical, it's purely symbolic, and that's possible. But what's also very interesting is the fact that in the year 393, a brilliant supernova, one of the brightest supernova in the last 2,000 years, happened on the banks of the Sky River, the Milky Way, the banks being the that boundary between the light and the dark spaces in the Milky Way, appeared right there at that point in the sky. Of course, as most supernovae do, it becomes very bright and then fades away. When the younger brother grew up to a ripe old age, he and his brother became the two of the closest stars nearby, Shala and Lasath. So what this is telling us is if astronomers collaborate with elders and stop thinking about oral tradition as myth and legend and see them as ways of transmitting knowledge and science, we can come to a lot of innovative discoveries and ways of being able to move forward. These traditions could inform astronomers on where to point their telescopes as astronomers are looking for supernova remnants. Or maybe you find one and you're trying to see if there's a tradition that discusses that, as has happened before. There's a lot of ways in which indigenous knowledge can inform Western science, but it's not just about how that benefits Western science. It's how can those two areas benefit each other. So I'm very excited to say that right now we have a whole range of astrophysics collaborations happening in research where it's not just education and outreach we have these collaborations, but it's, I'm sorry, not education and outreach, but it's actual research where we're collaborating with elders, we're collaborating with communities, working together, not seeing science or indigenous knowledge in different, uh, different planes, but seeing them together as different ways of understanding the world around us. And that's where we're going to find true innovation and carve a pathway forward into the future. Thank you. That was spectacular, Dwayne. It's um, really wonderful to look at the sky with different eyes from the eyes that I use in my day-to-day -day job as an astronomer. And that was wonderful. So we're I'm looking forward to the questions that we'll have at the end, and we'll have the opportunity to ask questions of Duane a little bit later. But before that, we're going to hear from our second speaker, 
Des Mongu. So Des is a Wadjuri Yamaji man, and he's come to us from Western Australia. He's the chair of the Wadjuri Liaison Committee, which was absolutely pivotal in negotiating the Indigenous Land Use Agreement for the Square Kilometre Array Observatory between the traditional custodians and the Murchis of the Murchison region and the Australian government so that we can move forward on this amazing project. And I'm going to get this wrong again, Des, because I'm going to pronounce the R where I shouldn't, but the SK Observatory is to be built on Inyari Mana? Did I? Yeah. I need to get rid of my Americanism, Ilgari Bundara, <laughs> which is the uh, place for the SK Observatory. So before we hear from Des, we're just going to play a short video about the SK Observatory so you can hear a little bit more about it. At first glance, this could be a plantation of Christmas trees in the Australian outback. But you're looking at what some are calling one of humanity's biggest ever scientific endeavours. This is an artist's impression of what's known as the SKA Low Telescope, currently being built in Western Australia. It's one of two critical components that when completed will together form the SKA Observatory, or SKAO. The second part is the SKA Mid Telescope, now under construction in South Africa. SKAO will consist of more than 130,000 antennas and almost 200 dishes across the two continents. That will make it the largest radio observatory in the world, promising to answer some of our biggest questions about the universe. ANU's Professor Naomi McClure-Griffiths is a fellow of the Australian Academy of Science who discovered a spiral arm of the Milky Way and is chair of SKAO's Science and Engineering Advisory Committee. She says SKAO will enable science to take a giant leap forward. It's the chance to be able to see the very first stars in the universe from when those turned on. And then everything from the very beginning to us here and looking at how planets form in our own galaxy. For that to happen, radio telescopes must be located a long way from other human-made transmissions, such as TV, radio and mobile phone signals, which can interfere with the relatively weak radio waves coming from space. That makes this site on Wajidi country ideal. It's already home to precursor telescopes like this one. The site itself is called in Yarimana Ilgari Bundara, the CSIRO Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory, which translates to sharing sky and stars. The traditional owners agreed to host the science facilities on their land as part of a broader agreement that will ensure educational, social and economic benefits for community. And the benefits to society as a whole can't be overstated. Science Minister Ed Husick says SKAO's cutting-edge technology will expose Australian businesses to new skills and capabilities. We will see those changes flow on for generations to come. SKAO will also enhance Australia's growing space industry, with scientists from around the world making regular use of the observatory. Some will even be on the lookout for intelligent extraterrestrial life. If an alien species were out there trying to reach out and say hello, by the time that radio signal got to Earth, it would have been so weak we wouldn't be able to detect it, says SKA Low Telescope Director Dr. Sarah Pierce. But that changes with SKAO. The observatory will start producing science before the end of the decade. So as you can see, it's a fairly remarkable project and we are extremely fortunate that the Wadri Yamaji are sharing their country with us to do this project. And I'm really looking forward to what Des has to tell us uh, about the project from his perspective. So welcome, Des. Thank you, Naomi. Thanks to Wayne, that was uh, quite quite interesting and uh, I uh, really enjoyed it. So thanks everybody. 
So first of all, I'd just like to acknowledge, pay an acknowledgement to the Ngunnawal people, and the traditional, traditional custodians of the land we are meeting on today, and recognise their people and families with connection to these lands and region. I'd also like to pay my respects, acknowledge the Wadri Yamaji people, the past, the present and the emerging, whose lands include the Inyamana, Ilgri Bundra and the CSIRO Murchison Radio Observatory site. I also pay the deepest respects to the Wadri Yamaji men and women that were involved with the project outcomes. I'd like to acknowledge in the audience we have here uh, Mr David Lachetti, who uh, was part of the uh, negotiation team or the lead negotiation for the, uh, for the Commonwealth. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank the Australian Science of Academy uh, for allowing me to attend this event. Uh, thanks, so thanks to Lisa and also Danny, who's also in the audience here from the SKA. So, thanks very much for that. <coughs> so, I'm no scientist. Uh, I'm not here to talk about science. Science is my favourite uh, uh, subject at school. I, when I was at school, I was given the opportunity. The headmaster called me in one day and said, school is not about, all about football, basketball or cricket. There's social studies, English, and maths to consider. So my response was, you didn't mention science. And he said, I didn't mention science because I know that was your favourite subject. So burning, burning stuff and putting stuff in jars and dissecting animals and doing all that thing, that was a favourite subject. So as a body of students at the school at uh, Mollawa District High School, we convinced the headmaster that to, to ensure that science was the last subject of, of the day because we stayed back longer to, to learn about science, which is exciting, it's kept us off the streets for an extra half hour or so. So that, so that was an exciting. So the Wadri country and the Wadri people. So Wadri country is 65,000 years. It's vast, it's barren, and it's beautiful. It's a country that's preserved its uh, majestic uh, traditions and its majestic culture. So the Wadri, Wadri country is open and barren and, it's, and it's, as I said, it's beautiful. <clears throat> so I'm actually here today to talk about the negotiations to that we got to the Iliwa, the final product of these negotiations. And I'm going to talk a bit about before and a bit, a bit about during the negotiations and the outcomes of the negotiations, where we are as Roger Yamaji people now and the benefits that we have by uh, agreeing to negotiate this agreement for the SKA project. So, Wadri country, prior to uh, the Square Kilometre Array, Bilardi Station was a uh, former remote sheep and cattle station, and it's in the Murchison area of the midwest of Western Australia. It was acquired by the CSIRO to build a, an observatory, which hosts the two SKA per, per skewer instruments. CSIRO's Australian Square Kilometre Array, the Pathfinder, and the Murchison uh, Midfield Array. So, the the Iliwa or the or the Iliwa is an Indigenous Land Use Agreement, and that Indigenous Land Use Agreement came about because of, of a negotiation between two parties, the the uh, the federal government and the SKA team, and the Wadri Yamaji negotiation team. It initially, there was a 2009 agreement for the uh, mergers and radio astronomy, astronomy. We all knew that project had to exp expand and had to become something more significant and more bigger and larger than it was. 
And we all understood that there was going to be an, another negotiation. There was going to be another Iliwa. And we all had to be involved with that Iliwa to ensure that we have the best outcome that can, because that, this was a 50-year project, a 50-year agreement. And it was 20 time, 27 times bigger than what it currently is now. And as I said, I'm going to talk about the, uh, uh, the negotiations. Uh, and, the, and the negotiations were about the Wadri Yamaji people having the benefits which they could preserve. And it's not all about financial benefits. It's not about money. We made it quite clear during our negotiations that we want a protection of our culture. Both negotiators uh, were, were hard, they were, they were long, they had a break in between with, the, with COVID. However, we were still on the pathway of coming to some sort of collusion for an Iliwa that benefited both of us. And I could stand here today and, and say that those negotiations were sometimes aggressive, sometimes peaceful. However, it came together because we were all determined to see this work. And as I say that, there's still not 100% uh, uh, acceptance by Wadri Yamji people. Some people still wanted their country protected and certain parts of their country protected. So during those negotiations, the main focus on, on what we could protect, what part of our country could be protected. And how do we protect that, that country? How do we ensure that those, those lands that we uh, cherish so much are being protected? What benefits then over these 50 years that we could gain out of this project? How do we, how do we uh, ensure that the benefits are going to be long lasting? They're going to be constructive and they're going to be suitable for what we want. And as I said, money wasn't a big effect. Uh, a big factor. It was what the Commonwealth could offer us for protection. And that protection is of, of, our, of, our, of our country. So during the negotiations, we as the Wadri Yamji uh, people uh, elected a working group at the beginning because our consent determination wasn't settled until 2018. These negotiations commenced prior to 2018. So the working group elected a, a negotiation team and that negotiation team was represented on behalf of the Wadri Yamji people to ensure that we have the best outcomes. And we came up from, from some stiff opposition and I'm sure that uh, the Commonwealth team led by David also agreed that they came up from uh, some stiff opposition as well because we knew what we wanted. We knew what the, what the SKA project was about and we also knew that we were going to battle to get what we wanted the way that we wanted to. It was a long process. It was a drawn out process but we all were on the same path and eventually, when we did come to the agreement, it was damned hard work. It was some of our negotiation team didn't agree. So convince the Wadri Yamaji people that the benefits that we were going to get were long term, and those benefits were going to in include every Wadri Yamaji person that were acknowledged as a Wadri Yamaji person. So as I said, hard negotiations. So during those negotiations, it was back and forth. We had people flying in and out of Canberra to Geraldton. Uh, <coughs> the meetings mostly took place in, in, in Geraldton because it was easily accessible to everybody. What we wanted out of this was heritage protection. We wanted our culture to be protected. And the protection of that culture was about how are we going to preserve that culture. 
So within the negotiation then, we set up what, what we call the Heritage Protection Committee. And that Heritage Protection Committee now meets uh, every three months. But also, we have the, the uh, Liaison Committee as well. So that Liaison Committee meets every three months as well. So we have two parts of this agreement to ensure that heritage is protected and culture is protected. And mainly the people that were on the negotiation team from the Commonwealth are the people on the uh, on these Heritage Protection Committee and the Liaison Committee, and that gives us consistency. And it gives us consistency because we all know what we wanted. We all knew how we uh, achieved that. <coughs> so that Iliwa was actually signed on the 15th of September, and it's actually the first of its kind globally for what we've uh, uh, what was signed. So the so the Wadri Yamji community voted unanimously to ensure this agreement was signed. And the negotiation team from the Commonwealth and the negotiation team from Wadri, they were all there on the day when, when the Wadri Yamji common law holders agreed that this Iliwa was a good thing for our people. And it offered to our people what our people wanted. Protection of country, financial benefits, and opportunities. And those opportunities I'll talk about in a minute, but they've been well received by our people. <coughs> so some of the benefits out of that agreement, it provides intergenerational benefits for up to 50 years. But also including that there's a lot of uh, non, a range of non-financial benefits and those include enterprise and training. Uh, out of that, we've set up a, uh, a, a world, a Wadri Enterprise Limited, which is uh, off from the, uh, from the Wadri Yamji Aboriginal Corporation. So that's an identity by itself, which has which just recently signed some joint ventures for the construction of the, of the Iliwa. <coughs> it's education, recognition of the Wadri Wadri Yamaji, and that recognition is the Inyamana uh, Indri Bulgara uh, naming of the Square Kilometre project. So that was one of the benefits. So now, worldwide, we receive that recognition through the naming of that, of, of that project. At this stage, and if I'm, we, we have probably 16 to 17 different countries involved in this project, and that gives us an opportunity to, to be recognised. <coughs> so as I said, this is a 50-year relationship, and it's an ongoing working relationship. And this ongoing working re relationship developed out of the negotiations for the Iliwa. And we see that as being a benefit, because the benefit is opportunities. Opportunity us to partner with the tier one contractors that are appointed by, by the project. So some of the benefits that we've, we've got at the moment, as I said, we've just signed a joint venture partner with, uh, 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 with Ventia to operate the uh, construction camp at, at, at the moment. So the construction camp to build the project, we have a joint venture with Ventia to construct that. We also have convinced the uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Philip Diamond that for the operation for the next five years of that construction camp, that it doesn't go out to tender, that the joint venture between Ventia and Wadri are the only tenderers for that project. We have now lodged that uh, uh, the, the paperwork for that, uh, for that uh, tender, and it's been lodged for two weeks now, and we're just waiting for the initial uh, consultation, and it takes a while for that to come through, but that's been lodged, and that's a, that's a long-term benefit. So those long-term benefits are going to give Wadri Yamji people stability, they're going to give them uh, self-governance, but 
govern it creates yourself and self-pride. So you're proud of what, what you've achieved. And we spread that message that what we get out of those benefits is what we, what we fought for. So <coughs> the other part of, of those benefits is that we have uh, an office, we have a business development manager, we have a liaison officer in the office, uh, we have constant engagement with CSIRO, SKA, we have constant interaction with all the people that were involved this, in the, this project. As I said earlier, it wasn't easy and it wasn't hard. It was just two parties coming together and understanding each other. Understanding what we wanted, understanding what they wanted. We've learned a valuable lesson as Roger Yamaji people during this negotiation period. And that valuable lesson is, if you want to come and negotiate with us, you come and negotiate with nothing. You don't walk through the door and give us a figure or a price of what you want. We've got nothing. We've got our land, which we want preserved. If you want something from us, you come to us with nothing because we're coming through you, to you with nothing. We're going to sit down at the beginning of this and we're going to negotiate because what negotiation means to us is two parties coming together and understanding what the other party needs. We don't want to start with a figure up here and we come somewhere in between. We want to start here with nothing. Then we want to build it up. We're only going to build that up together. And that's a valuable lesson that we learnt in those six years that we did the negotiation for the, for the Iliwa. And it's a valuable lesson that we're going to move and take forward when we, as a proud nation of Audrey Yamji people, are going to build on the prosperity of what we achieved through this negotiation. What these benefits that we receive are long-term benefits that uh, for the interest and, and the, the benefit of all Wadri Yamji people. So the negotiation was a valuable lesson. It's one thing that we've taken away from that. And it's one thing that we're going to move forward in the way that we deal with people in the long term. We have those benefits. We have financial benefits, which is absolutely fantastic. Gives us and our people an opportunity to understand and realise what we could do. And in saying that and closing off on that, <coughs> those, sorry, that is sensitive. So those benefits, they're there, but also what it does make us do as Roger Yamaji people is it makes us be determined to advance our own cause and to advance our own cause to develop and sustain our people into the future. And those are employment opportunities, business opportunities, and self-preservation self, uh, for each other. We know, we know for the next 50 years that our culture is going to be protected in a certain area. We know that. That's what we wanted. And we know it's going to be protected because we know that our negotiation was the right was the right thing to do. Otherwise, the land that was purchased, Bellardi Station, was purchased by CSIRO. We know that that land could have been, you know, they could have come and said, this is what we're going to do. Sit down at the table with us and discuss something and you'll get some benefits. But they approached us in a different manner. They approached us to negotiate with them. And we're very appreciative of that. We have now something to move forward with. And what we have is a great learning curve that everybody that wants to be involved with this project have to come to us. Everybody that's involved in the project are required to attend a cultural awareness course. Everybody that goes out to Bellardi to the project prior to them going out to that project, has to understand Wadri, Yamaji, customs, 
and traditions. I don't use the word law because we don't have law uh, carried out in our country anymore. But the, the customs and traditions of the Wadi Yamaji people are now protected for 50 years. And that's the most important thing to us and that's the most important thing for us during this negotiation. So, thanks everybody for listening. I know I've, I've only had 20 minutes and I could have stood up here and talked about this project for 20 years. So, but it was, I just wanted to get across the points that we had to negotiate, we had to, but we actually achieved what we wanted. So thanks everybody and uh, looking forward to some questions. Thanks very much, Des. It's uh, fantastic to hear about the mutual benefits. And I'm really looking forward to personally going through the Wadri cultural training myself in two weeks. So I'm really looking forward to that. OK, so now I'd like to invite questions from the audience for both of our speakers. Um, you can submit your questions online by scanning the QR code on your screen if you're online. Um, or you can come up to the microphone, which is <coughs> there. We have incredible microphone runners here. Um, so, can I open the floor for questions? Don't all jump at once. <laughs> Anything online, Viv? Yes, we have a few online. Um, I'm here to read out some of the questions from online. So, uh, the first one uh, is for Dwayne uh, from the first talk. Uh, this is a question from Grace in Brisbane. Uh, Grace asks, you mentioned when you began your career, many pe people believed there was no Indigenous science. Thanks for not continuing this ignorance and for redirecting your research. Do you feel our nation has come very far in its understanding of this important part of our history? Relatively, yes. Yes. Um, when I began working in this 15 years ago, I mean, this is something the elders have been shouting from mountaintops for decades. This isn't anything new. Um, so it's not like I'm, I'm doing something that nobody else has done before. But about, it, it was, for me, about helping to change the narrative and showing through whatever means that I could how we could rethink this. And, you know, what I, what I saw when I began looking for a PhD project in this area was just rejection after rejection. Nobody thought it was worth doing. Nobody wanted to touch it with the 10-foot pole, as we might say in the U.S., and everybody just kind of wanted to back off from that. And now, not only do we have a lot of room in the academic space for this, but across the whole country, the demand for everything relating to an indigenous astronomy is just completely off the charts. There's tourism programs, there's gallery exhibitions, there's you know, commemorative coins, there's major projects, there's astrotourism, there's, I mean, everything, almost every facet uh, has created a huge demand for this because it's exciting when we think about astronomy tends to be the most popular of the sciences. It really gets everybody excited and passionate, which everybody here can agree with, right? And when it comes to Aboriginal culture in the media, it always tends, it tends to largely be something quite negative. So this is a way of trying to change that and getting people excited about it in a different way. So I think Indigenous astronomy has been a great way of being able to showcase. Knowledge has been around for a long time, tens of thousands of years, and, and to help platform the voices of the elders. So we, we see this happening across the wider part of the country. You know, even in academia, as I mentioned to you before, um, ten years ago when I applied for a fellowship, the field of research codes, I had to use other studies in human society to put it in for a project on indigenous astronomy. And now we have four codes specifically for that area. It's one little thing, but you kind of think about the snowballing effect that this, this work with the communities and the elders have had over the last ten years has really taken off to levels we never expected. And now we've got a whole new generation of Aboriginal people pursuing various degrees at different stages in astronomy and astrophysics who are going to be the next generation. Um, and hopefully, you know, they will be changing the very sad statistic that as of today, there is one PhD qualified Aboriginal astrophysicist. It's Dr. Stacy Mater. He's a Gidja man who works um, for the CSIRO out at the Parks Radio Telescope. Okay, the ice was broken by the online crowd. So how about for the uh, in-person crowd? Do we have any questions?
Uh, thank you for a fascinating presentation. My question is whether the, there's an opportunity for the Indigenous knowledge to help inform the science agenda that will be carried out by the SKO. Just sort of bringing together Dwayne's presentation and then the comments that Des was making. Will there be that opportunity for input on the science agenda? And, and, yeah, and, and, and thanks for that. And uh, yes, there is an opportunity. And those opportunities are coming about by the educational programs that we have in place. But it also gives us opportunity now to, to talk with people like Dwayne on how we, how we could embed that into, into what we hope to achieve. So there's always those opportunities and, and we're encourage, encouraging our people to actually take up some of these opportunities. You know, they might start low, but you have to get to a stage where this gives us great opportunity. Our, our knowledge of our land on our boundaries is through the sky and the stars. Not, not only the, the, uh, the mountains and the rivers and the trees, but it's also what's above. And Dwayne pointed out earlier, what's above is what's down below. So what's above for us matches up with what's down below. So the stars tell us how far our boundaries extend to and what, what's within our boundaries. It also tells us when the emus are ready to lay eggs and we're ready to go hunting, it gives us an indication of, of when that happens. So when the, when the sky changes, we know that then the emus are going to go start laying. So that gives us that, that above, gives us the knowledge on the ground to start looking at that. So yes, so there is those opportunities, but we have to take up those opportunities by speaking with people like Dwayne. So. And if I can take the MC prerogative on that, the, the history, the traditional history that has set where the antennas are actually placed for the SK Observatory is an amazing aspect that the traditional history has placed how we are going to look at the sky, has determined how we look at the sky there. Um, and I think that's a really nice connection with that quote about everything in the land is reflected in the sky. That, that does, yes. Yeah. And, 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 and that history extends not only for where the, where the project is, the project is only a small part of Wadri country. It's only a small area compared to what the whole of the Wadri uh, country, country is. So, th and this is why it's so special to us that we have this project and it's not only special because we have the project, we have benefits out of it. It's also special to us because we now have, as Wadri Yamji people, we now have world, worldwide recognition. As I said, there's 16 or 17 different countries involved with it, so that expands our expands out the Wadri Yamji people to all the people in these 16 uh, or 17 different countries. So. All right. We have time for probably one more question. Do we have another here? Yeah. Thanks. I've spent many nights bushwalking in Northern Australia, lying on a hot rock in the evening, looking up at the Milky Way and on moonless nights, the dark emu, and I'm just always in awe of the Magellanic Clouds. But let's get closer. Perhaps I was in postdoc in Germany and realized I didn't understand the phases of the moon. And I'd learned this at school, but it just, it, there was no deep understanding. And I was reminded of this with um, Duane's initial f f um, images of the moon, crescent moon, and how you look at the crescent moon, for example, oh, I can't remember. There was one when that was just inverted, and you can look at that and say, well, the sun is right below us, whereas the other one, crescent like that, the sun's below the horizon off there. And I was wondering to what extent the, the phases of the moon uh, inform indigenous knowledge of the sky and I suppose it's something that changes much more regularly than than the yearly cycles of, of the stars. It's probably your thing Matt. So you okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll come in after and say it's it's it's, it's <laughs> quite prominent and the things that you learn from the elders 
about the phase of the moon. You can think, okay, we got first quarter, full moon, third quarter, new moon, waxing gibbous, waning crescent, those kinds of things. Uh, in a lot of traditional cultures, there is a specific and unique name for every single day of lunation cycle. 30 different names, well, 29 different names of the moon uh, that are all unique. And there's memory techniques for learning those songs you can utilize. But what I find fascinating is not only the link between the moon phases, but you look at that, the cusp, what angle of the cusps. I can tell you about different times of the year where you might have a change in rainfall, especially if you're in an area that has a distinct wet or dry season. But also other things that tie in with the phase of the moon, such as special ceremonies that are held in the Torah Strait. In the Torah Strait, an astronomer is called a Zugabu Mabaig. It literally means constellation person. And that's traditional astronomy. That's not a modern translation. That's a traditional role. And that person would go through years of intense instruction in the quad, a place of learning. And one of the very senior levels of knowledge only took place on very rare occasions. It was a ceremony that was planned well in advance. It had a special dari, a special headdress, a special dance and ceremony. That only took place during a total lunar eclipse. And the ceremony was performed when the moon went red. So you've got understanding the, the phases of the moon, you know, going through the cycle, the moon disappearing for three days before coming back to life, um, these cycles tying in with that, but also a lot of traditions about lunar eclipses and also solar eclipses and how they work. And knowing that during a solar eclipse, it's the moon covering the sun. Even though you can't see the moon, you know it's there. So it takes... Uh, a special recognition, a special uh, power to know exactly where the moon is at every point in the sky, even when you can't see it. Of course, it's linked to tides and it's linked to uh, annual rainfall and things of that nature. But the one thing that came out that I was that I was surprised, but not surprised, to learn about were these ceremonies that tie in with the lunar eclipse. Because in the canon of the history of science, an indigenous oral culture has never been cre given credit for being able to predict a lunar eclipse. But as the elders told me, this is planned well in advance by the Zugabu Mabaig. And to them, well, of course you predict the lunar eclipse. That's when they told you when that was going to happen. And I'm sitting here going, you know that's nowhere in science is that recognized. And they're like, well, I'm not surprised. <laughs> but it just, what, what I'm getting at is, is the levels of knowledge are so deep and so complex in that, that I think if you're not from that culture, it might seem to boggle your mind. But um, it's important that we learn from those communities because there's so much that we can that we can learn from them and so much we can share for the future. Could I, I, I just add a bit to that? Because again, with the ceremonies and the way that we survived and the way that we traveled around being such a transient uh, a, a group of people, that the moon and the stars gives us direction. What it does for us now is to bring the Western science in line with what we call our cultural science. So. We, align, we can align those two up now because we know more about it. We know more about the Western science now and we could bring those two together to understand better what our old people have survived for so long and why the moon and the stars were in certain places in the sky and where that came down to tell us where our certain different areas of Wadri Yamagi or, or Nanda or t tells us where the different uh, people live and survive, and it's not all about what's on the ground. It's also you have to combine it and work it up with, with what's in the sky as well. I think that is a beautiful way to end it, where we bring together joined knowledge systems. And I'm afraid I know there are probably more questions, but we're out of time for this evening. I'd really like to thank both Des and Dwayne for joining us tonight and sharing with us their knowledge. And I greatly appreciate you sharing your time as well. Um, so I'd also like to thank the conveners of this series, Tom and Jordan, who we heard from earlier, and Vanessa. And I'd like to thank Edge Catering, who provided us with very yummy cheese. I hope you partook of some of that. It's very nice. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank all of you for coming and, and sharing with us and for your good questions. And I hope that we'll see you back here for the final installment of Looking Back Moving Forward, which will be on Tuesday, the 12th of December and there'll be more information available soon about that. So thank you all very much, and good night. <laughs>